Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Mr. Sokowski. I teach AP Euro and AP World. Uh, for today's video, I'm going to be doing the second exam crash course. The purpose of this video is basically to tell you the main points to know from each period. Um, this is going to be period two. Uh, each video should hopefully be only 10 minutes to like a quick crash course. The purpose of this is that if you do not know what I'm talking about or a phrase I'm not taught, you don't understand the, the word or the person or the event, that's when you want to go back into your notes and double check that you know it because these are the most important ones throughout teaching this course that I feel that would be better, best prepare you for all the components of the AP exam. Okay, so that being said, period two is from 1648 to 1815. Uh, this is important because this encompasses the age of absolutism, which is from about 1648 to 1815. It encompasses the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the age of absolutism is absolute monarchs, complete control, complete power. This is Louis XIV starting it, leading up always like Louis XVI and then the French Revolution. The and a little bit later on. The Industrial Revolution is industry created by um, agricultural revolution, leading to a population boom, leading to industry being created. This is particularly, especially um, involving England. The Enlightenment is something that's basically coming into the 1700s or, or so, and that's basically the idea of applying reason to every aspect of society, from politics to um, art to government to economics. So it's an important one to know. Um, I like to think of the Enlightenment as the Renaissance 2.0 kind of thing going forward. And then you have the French Revolution. Important key here with the year 1815 is that it's very crucial is because that's when the um, Congress of Vienna is signed, which basically rebalances Europe after Napoleon Bonaparte. So they don't pick 1815 in particular for any just whatever reason. 1815 is a very popular one because that basically signifies the Congress of Vienna, which officially uh, is what happens to Europe after Napoleon Bonaparte. So that's what they're really alluding to when you see that pop up. Okay. So the French Revolution, the overthrow of the French monarchy, 1789, ending with the Napoleonic Wars, and then basically ending with the year 1815. So these are some of the most important words to know. Um, absolute monarchy or absolute ruler. They want to rule, rule absolutely all aspects of fashion, clothes, uh, economics, political, religious. That's the imperative idea of an absolute monarch. Frederick II um, was more of an enlightened uh, monarch during this time of Prussia, so he's one of those ones you want to think of. Usually they refer to uh, Frederick II and Maria Theresa of Austria as enlightened absolute monarchs, which are people that are, are mo absolute monarchs that have enlightenment ideologies imp implied in it. Divine right is what these kings are saying they get their absolute power from. It's from divinity, and this is especially seen with like um, God giving them their power. Especially seen with Louis the Fourteenth and creating the Palace of Versailles, and that's something that they basically fight and toil with all the way up into like the revolutions of, of France and America and so forth. Uh, Jean, ba oh, sorry, um, Versailles is basically the so you have Louis the Thirteenth. I'm sorry, Louis the Fourteenth, which builds the Palace of Versailles, and Versailles is the best epitome of the age of absolute monarchies, is because it is literally where he has everyone move all the government officials and it is the physical symbol of absolute monarchies and France under Louis the 14th and the Palace of Versailles is like the bee's knees of this term of absolutism. Um, you know, I just talked about Versailles, English Bill of Rights. This is something that it's alluded to with the Glorious Revolutions um, going forward with issues with Parliament and the monarchy and the English Bill of Rights is one of those things that's just getting like a step up. It's, an, it's basically evolving ever since the Magna Carta way back when, 1215, to kind of like up into the 1640s, 1650s, and, and, and forward. And the, basically the English Bill of Rights literally gives more rights to people rather than just being nobles. And you're starting to see the power go from the monarchy and parliament. And it's starting to basically equalize in England. And that's important because it becomes the focal point of what you think of modern day democracy, which the American Revolution utilizes a lot of those ideas created during these uh, the Eng uh, English history and applies it to America and they start their, their own country and we adapt a lot of those types of rules and legislations and ideas like Bill of Rights and so forth. But that's why I said English Bill of Rights so make sure you know you're talking about England and not America. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert is important because he's the finance minister that's basically in the age of Louis which is um, Louis the 13th, Louis the 14th, Louis the 14th hires him and he is the finance minister basically puts 
the purse strings taking care of all like the finance of France and he puts it under the control of the king and that's basically he's like a really good accountant okay if you want to put it that way he's like the best accountant and he puts France's like money gain on point um and like absolutism we talked about the war of Austria into sections this is basically what to do after um the breaking up of Austria and this is something that alludes to Maria Theresa if you don't know what it is you want to kind of just do a little quick view on it um you might get something like that that goes along with the partition of poland which is encompassing in the ideas of, of uh austrian succession the seven years war against is uh it's a it's a it's a, a little bit of information that you might get in there or you might get a lot it depends on what, what kind of questions and what kind of format of the test you get but um you know about the partition of poland is basically the splitting it up of mary Theresa and the issues dealing with the uh austrian succession that's a whole lesson right there Seven Years' War, same thing too. Basically, that that includes the idea of internal and external fighting between European countries. But you want to know these kind of things, just do a little quick research or Google, or I have crash course videos linked into this, this document. Again, like and subscribe if you like this document. Um, there's a, a copy if you're um, if you want to get it. Link on the bottom, okay? Uh, Peter the Great of Russia, he's known as the Enlightened, uh, not really Enlightened Emperor, but he's basically the one that westernizes uh, Russia, and he's like the old school one that you would need to know before like the um, Nicholas II, Catherine the Great, all that stuff later on in Russian history. He's the one that westernizes Russia, he's the first one to open up uh, St. Petersburg, and this is one of those famous topics that you need to know of Russian history. Uh, Frederick William the first of Prussia. He was another um, kind of modern enlightened emperor But they usually ask you Catherine the Great and then Maria Theresa and then maybe Peter the uh, Frederick the William of Prussia Declaration of rights of man and citizen This is something imposed under the French Revolution. This is new ideas uh, basically This is kind of a, a after the American Revolution. So this is the French Revolution's version of it The Ottoman Empire literally leads to Spain defeats the Ottoman Empire um, the Battle of Lepanto, so that's something you might want to hear about, but that basically put Spain um, on uh, on the mark as a superpower. The French Revolution, you want to know the phases of the French Revolution, there are four phases. Um, look them up if you if you want to know what's going on with them. Jean-Baptiste, uh, Jean-Paul Marat was basically a writer of the um, French Revolution. He's the one who really caused a bunch of ruckus while it was unfolding. Uh, committee of public sorry in the execution of Louis the 16th now, that's an important one to know remember Louis the 14th builds the palace of Versailles Louis the 16th is the one that gets his head chopped off from Marie Antoinette uh, in during one of the phases of the French Revolution don't mix up your Louis with um, a Piero because they will get on you for that the committee of public safety is something that's created under Maximilien Robespierre this is also known as the reign of terror this part here was one of the phases of the French Revolution that phase ends with the directory phase and the directory phase is like a weak version of the French Revolution which then you get Napoleon Bonaparte coming in and knocking out okay the Jacobin clubs is a political club that takes over um, during the, one of the phases of the well throughout the French Revolution so they're a very famous one but they don't really have a lot of experience so that kind of leads to the understanding of um, enlightened people but not really having the governmental procedures to run a country and that really unfolds very drastically with seeing, seeing the reign of terror or public safety kind of emerge. Maximilian Robespierre, again, you need to know who he is with the reign of terror, the Committee of Public Safety. It's not a safety public thing. It's literally they, they chop people's heads off with the guillotine. So remember that. It doesn't sound like that. The Levige is basically one of the, the things that uh, Louis XIV does as a ceremonial thing for his people in Versailles. So he's kind of like showing his power by having people do random nonsensical ceremonies so that he always has them under his thumb uh, march on versailles by the women basically that's during the phase of the revolution you need to know who that happens with the women going and marching at versailles concord of 1801 this is basically signifies um napoleon as being a supreme leader and crowning himself that's a very important napoleon um fact again they love the french revolution so you need to know your french revolution really well get into the details i'm saying and know what they are and the functions of them going forward the haitian revolution is um toussaint leo Tour is from the french uh, haitian revolution 
Haitian Revolution is because Haiti is basically a colony of France. So while France is having its revolution, the slaves that were living in Haiti from the French had their own revolution. And Toussaint Leauverture is one of those people that <clears throat> proceeds in that, that fighting of the Haitian Revolution. Napoleon Bonaparte, you got to know Napoleon. In case he's a military leader, he basically uh, takes over the weak directory phase of the French Revolution. There's four phases. It ends with Napoleon, no more phases. Napoleon is emperor and causes ruckus, taking over uh, mainland uh, continental Europe. Basically, just fails to take Britain, it fails to take Russia. Um, you need to know his basically his, his attack against the continental system, trying to strangle whole Britain. And then his uh, fighting against Russia, which he also loses, which they do the scorched earth policy. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to look those terms up. It's an important one going forward. Uh, again, a lot of the stuff, you, you if you don't know it, then just kind of go forward and look over the stuff that you don't know. In Napoleon military tactics, I talked about that. The continental system taking over England fails. And then when he fights the Russians um, with his grand army, he fails because they do the scorched earth policy, which they burn everything down while he's trying to invade them. And then they, he ends up, they end up starving the French to death while they're trying to st attack. Nationalism is basically culture, unity, um, history, language, religion unifies people under an idea, not under a monarchy. And the Congress of Vienna finally puts the kibosh on Napoleon Bonaparte, and it creates also the Concert of Europe, which is basically, um, the Congress of Vienna is important because it basically signifies the end of Napoleon Bonaparte, but it really addresses the problem of European countries because they depended on this idea of balance of power, which is like a kind of like a non-binding uh, contract between the European countries saying if a country kind of like went out of whack or became too powerful, the other countries would naturally take it down and pull it down to equal stances, balancing it out. And that was all well and good working up into the French Revolution. Now when France has its melt breakdown where they, they kill their king, and then it ends with a Napoleon taking over most of Europe. The rest of the countries, after they finally defeat, defeat uh, Napoleon at Waterloo and all that stuff, um, they really think that they should come up with a formal agreement to avoid any future Napoleon Bonaparte's running over trying to take over Europe. So like, hey, we should actually have some rules. So if you have a breakdown or you're having issues, we can come into your country and support you. That way we don't lead to this thing of having one of us lose our heads and then it really leads to everyone else losing their heads pretty much as it goes forward okay so it's like a self-preservation thing the concert of europe uh coming out of the congress of vienna if you heard of that from your professor it literally means that they should meet periodically to make sure everyone's monarchy is good right you want your monarchy good over there so then that way napoleon doesn't pop out of there and tries to kill me and vice versa so i can get involved and help you out if you're having a revolution on your hands now the um the idea of the world economic system is creating putting out system and cottage industry were prior to the industrial revolution they're more home uh grown mom and pop ways of creating things like the idea of textiles is important that's going to be an industrial revolution question wherever you are um in history uh the middle passage is basically the triangular trade right from europe to africa to the americas back to europe a triangle kind of focused and the Middle Passage refers to the, the forced migration of Africans from Africa to be enslaved in America for profit. Okay, so you need to know a little bit about that. In European context, there's a lot of wealth and influence coming in because of that. And then American and world history do more in detail of um, the Middle Passage in that sense. Uh, plantation economy is literally what's created in um, the New World, creating fucking plantations, and that's a new economic feature. Through this process, the Europeans get very wealthy because all that money and loot and everything else coming from the rest of the world is being funneled into Europe, and that also helps funnel the powerful countries to become super superpowers in the age of imperialism. Industrial revolution, industry factories, uh, things that were not made by people are now being made. Uh, one thing, sorry, things that were made by people are now being made by machines. And then here are the ideas of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is important and it stems into the ideas of the scientific revolution. The Enlightenment is more about using your ideas. Science was the natural world being examined by reason and through scientific process to figure out the world, stuff that we use today. Empiricism is literally one of the, you think of it like compiling data from uh, an experiment. Basically that's what empiricism is compiling of data like a mountain like an empire 
and through the analysis of that data you can come up with better conclusions like computer data like you can think about our version of it today this is the start of that not just to do one experiment and say oh that was it my hypothesis was right my hypothesis was wrong no you do it over and over and over a little differently different experiments and through the compiling and analysis of data you can come up with better uh, understanding of the world enlightenment basically to be enlightened is to become like a light bulb coming on in your head to be enlightened with art, music, philosophy, economics, anything you can imagine. Government, sprite is the best term because you can social enlightenment, political enlightenment, religious enlightenment, thinking about new ideas, religious eyes, intellectual from sprite, so it's definitely that. Technology, a little bit more involved with the industrial revolution, and economics is a perfect one with Adam Smith. Voltaire, the pen is mightier than the sword. You need to know him. He basically just wrote and criticized people by writing issues to them. Uh, of monarchs and rulers and government and he basically told them what was what with thousands of letters circulating he actually uh, penned um, with Catherine the Great and other the enlightened empress and he inspired her with ideas um, Diderot is the first one to create the encyclopedia which is basically your first version of like Google search or Wikipedia like this is the encyclopedia so think of Wikipedia mm -hmm. but like a real like a real book kind of thing um, Voltaire, uh, sorry, we talked about Voltaire. You have John Locke. These are basically the most important ones from um, the Enlightenment. John Locke was the ideas um, of rights. Um, Rousseau will be one of the ones that you'll want to know going forward with the best enlightened ideas going forward. It was between Locke, and that's the idea of like natural rights, something that's embodied in the American uh, democracy going forward. Nat Rousseau is just like social contracts. You want to know that going forward. Natural rights would be stuff that you get rights because you were born in this earth. Like, you know, you have the right to have free speech, you have the right to religion, you have the right to eat, you have the right to not be persecuted without unjust laws. So that's the idea of natural rights, which is an important um, concept. Salons are where these ideas of the Enlightenment spread. Salons are not where you um, get your hair done like you think today, but it's basically um, where the salons were the sections of the house of rich uh uh, French and it was where women of uh, French society would hold their gatherings at these salons and that became an influential part to share the enlightenment ideas because these are not stuff that this is not ideas that you want to be sharing too much on the street you don't know who's who and you don't know if you're gonna get killed from it right so these are like these sacred areas where really for women helped facilitate the spread of enlightenment ideologies um, Madame Dufont, she was one of those ones that had a salon. She was very popular in France. She held such great dignitaries as like Benjamin Franklin, who became, you know, a perfect lineage between French and American um, times during the revolution. So that's one of those things that had spread to these areas. Adam Smith, you need to know Adam Smith and you need to know Karl Marx, okay? Like, it is more than anything because they basically become the two economic systems that were created during the ages of the Enlightenment, during this period in, in um, European history, and a little bit later with Karl Marx, and they are the economic systems we are encountering in today's world too, with communism and capitalism, okay? So Adam Smith would be uh, capitalism, free market, laissez-faire economics, the free market, the invisible hand, you need to know these things so much so because that's literally what America is, uh, capitalist societies are, and the idea is that basically a portion of the earth follows as economic principles of following. The other one will be communist ideologies, command economies, which will be Karl Marx later. You need to know those two in detail, okay? So that's why Adam Smith, free market. Montesquieu was basically through the spirit of laws. Montesquieu is important because he comes up with this idea during the enlightenment of balance of powers. And balance of powers is really important because he says, through his, his dictation, he says there should be just three powers always balancing it out so that way one power doesn't become too powerful, becoming a dictator or monarch, absolute monarch. And that becomes a quintessential thing that the American um, government is created off of. These enlightenment ideologies, our founding fathers say we should have three branches of government, you know, we should have the executive, legislative, and judicial, and they were always balancing it out, having power over each other. And that's purposely set up that way not one can become too powerful, such as a King George, where the American uh, Revolution was breaking away from, okay? So that's important because the American Revolution and later on democracies uh, further from that point, 
utilize a lot of the Enlightenment ideologies, like pretty much all of them, and then they intertwine them into their government. Okay. Mary Wollstonecraft, um, sorry, social contract we talked about, the spirit of laws. Social contract would be Rousseau, Olympe de Gouges, and Mary Wollstonecraft are basically, Olympe de Gouges is important because she wrote the, the uh, rights of the female citizen, so she's also fighting for equality during the French Revolution. Mary Wollstonecraft are basically writers and influential uh, women of French and um, uh, French history for Olympe, and basically they are Enlightenment women that are pushing forward boundaries for women in the 17, 16, 1700s uh, going forward. So it's important for women because it shows that they were fighting for rights way back when and further back, not just um, in the 1900s, 1800s, and the 1960s and 70s and so forth, and today. Um, physocrats are basically people that are believing in actual physical world, and um, David Hume would be one of those ones that you would want to know going forward. But Adam Smith is one of the most important salons, um, and so forth. So hopefully this is a good crash course for you. If not, there's this, this crash course that I put up for you on as a video link. And um, remember, kind of know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about for anything like this, make a note on it, go back to it, write it down, highlight it, look it up, put it in your brain. This is just a good, quick crash course. If it's like the night before and you're freaking out or something, um, hopefully this makes you feel a little bit better. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye.